Easter is a very special time, isn't it? I mean, for Christians, it is such a special occasion. Arguably, it's more special than Christmas in some ways. And Easter is that time of year when we reflect on the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. It's perhaps the best time of year, I think, to remind ourselves that Christianity is not about what we do, it's about what he has done. We believe in some amazing events in history, the accomplishments of Jesus. It's all about him and what he has done. Um, and therefore Christianity is not good advice, it's good news. It's not good advice, it's good news. It's about something that's happened. And at Easter, we always look afresh at these events. Uh, on Good Friday, we had a breakfast in here at 10 o'clock. And those of you who came along, it was so fun. I mean, we, we do think we've got the, the best outlook for a church in the UK. <laughs> and uh, it was nice to utilise that. Um, but we also reflected on Jesus' death through the lens of a curious passage in John 11. And on Good Friday, we remembered that Jesus was literally God's avatar, if you like, God incarnate, who came, lived amongst us, and on that Good Friday, that first Good Friday, there in himself took on the brunt of divine justice and died in our place. He took on all my shame, sin, guilt, uh, greed, materialism, pride, and he absorbed in his own body the punishment that I deserve. But today is Easter Sunday, and so I wanted to, quite predictably, reflect on Jesus' resurrection. Now, the bodily resurrection is one of the fundamental, non-negotiable truth claims of the Christian faith. It appears in all major creeds. It pulses behind every page, every word of the New Testament. Um, it is the fundamental event for the, actually the, the full beginning of Christianity as those disciples were transformed by a resurrected Jesus that first Easter Sunday. And while the cross is usually the symbol of our faith, without the resurrection, we wouldn't have a symbol or a faith. It was the Apostle Paul writing to the Christians in the first century in Corinth that said, if Christ has not been raised, if there's no resurrection, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Now, I have a talk called The 17 Reasons Why I Believe That Jesus Rose From The Dead, which is basically all the reasons I can muster um, why I think the resurrection stacks up historically um, and has historic, um, historical credibility. Um, I'm not going to give that tonight. Uh, that, that takes me an hour, really. Um, I can squeeze it into half an hour, perhaps. But what I want to do tonight is look at the purpose of the res resurrection, not so much its historicity. Uh, I'll give that another time. But the purpose of the resurrection. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? What was the purpose or purposes of it? I know many Christians that can articulate why Jesus died. They can articulate their faith through Jesus' death on the cross. But a lot of Christians I come across can't articulate very well why Jesus rose from the dead. Well, I just want to give you five reasons. I'm sure there's more, but here are the five main reasons why Jesus' resurrection happened. The purpose of Jesus' resurrection. And I actually think you can see all five purposes in Luke 24. All of them are there within this final chapter of Luke's biography. So I hope you have it open in front of you. As I can see, most of you do. Some of you taking notes, which is great. Others taking mental notes, hopefully. Um, 
But let me read from uh, just the final few verses of Luke 23. Reading from verse 55. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee, so these are the female followers of Jesus from up north in Galilee. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee are now with Jesus. They've seen him crucified in Jerusalem. Followed Joseph, that's Joseph of Arimathea, and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. They saw the gravesite. This is the first Good Friday. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But then they rested on the Sabbath, that is the Saturday, in obedience to the commandment. And then chapter, one of, uh, chapter 24, of verse 1. On the first day of the week, the Sunday, what we're celebrating today, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. I was contemplating calling this sermon Jesus, the Spice Girls and the Rolling Stone, but I'll spare you from it. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. The reason Jesus rose, or one of the reasons Jesus rose from the dead, the first one, is that the resurrection vindicated what Jesus said. The resurrection vindicated what Jesus said. It vindicated his words. He said time and time again that he would be raised from the dead. He also said that he would be crucified or that he would at least die. He predicted this on numerous occasions and in various ways. And his own resurrection therefore backs up that he speaks the truth that he predicts and it comes true. So the resurrection functions like many of the other miracles and they back up the claims of Jesus. So you think of the paralytic who is lowered through the roof and Jesus is there and these guys have lowered their friend through the roof to get healed. And Jesus says to the paralytic, mate, this is the Australian version, mate, your sins are forgiven. And everyone's going, well, how can he forgive sins? You know, that's God's job, not man's. How can can this person forgive sins? In order to back up his words, his claims, his authority to forgive sins, Jesus then says, so that you know that my words are true and then I can forgive sins, I say to the paralytic, get up, take your mat and go home. And the miracle happens. The miracle authenticates, vindicates affirms, proves Jesus' words, in this case, to forgive. Well, think of the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus says, before he raises Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. Then he raises Lazarus. The miracle vindicates Jesus' words, that he's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, this is the ultimate sign miracle to say that everything Jesus has said and taught that he is this one and his words can be trusted we can trust his words the resurrection there puts him on a level beyond any other religious figure in history you could argue that Buddha said some great things Muhammad said some great things Winston Churchill Nelson Mandela Shakespeare, whoever your heroes are, Confucius, Dalai Lamas in the past, have all said and taught great things, perhaps. But none of them have come back from the dead. The resurrection puts Jesus' words, what he has to say about life and about God and about death and eternity, it vindicates 
everything he's been saying in the New Testament. So that's the first thing. The resurrection vindicates Jesus' words. The second thing, the resurrection vindicates who Jesus is. It it vindicates who Jesus is. And this beautifully comes through in the story uh, with the two on the road to Emmaus, beginning in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now why are they going? This is clearly followers of Jesus. Why are they leaving the scene? Now, the same day, that is that Sunday, when the women came to the tomb and the angel has said to them, remember his words. He said he would rise from the dead. They know about this. But why are they leaving? It's, because, it's precisely because they don't think that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, is the one who can save them. Look how it goes on. They're walking away towards this town of Emmaus. We're not really sure exactly where Emmaus is. There are a few theories, probably west of uh, Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that happened. What we glean from um, uh, John's Gospel, who mentions, I think, Cleopas, is that this is probably then Cleopas and his wife, a couple, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, a man and a woman. Uh, We can't say that conclusively, but it's pretty likely uh, there's a cross-reference in John's Gospel who mentions Cleopas and his wife, Mary. So presumably it's a man and a woman, they're going back, going back to Jerusalem. And you can imagine, verse 14, how they're chatting about everything, about what Jesus did and what he said. You know, Jesus was an amazing orator. He took on the most eminent thinkers of his day. He walked on water. Uh, he fed the 5,000. He healed people of all different types of maladies. He did amazing things. They were talking with with each other about everything that had happened and then how he died. Why didn't he do anything? They were probably there at the crucifixion, seeing Jesus nailed to that Roman crucifix. And they're now thinking, he's not the one. If he was the one, this wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't have died. And so they're heading home. As they discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. Jesus is in his Clark Kent uniform at this stage, not revealing his full status. Maybe he's got a hoodie on. Uh, There are caravans of people coming back from Jerusalem at this stage, as in lots and lots of people. And maybe it's a little dark and they can't make out Jesus' face or their eyes are supernaturally prevented from seeing Jesus. We don't know, but they can't recognise Jesus at this stage. And that is a theological point. That they don't see Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. They don't get it. They're just viewing him as a human figure, at least. Just another travelling companion. And then Jesus asks, verse 17, What are you discussing as you talk together and walk along the road here? And that question was so amazing that it stopped them walking. Can you see that in the next sentence? They stood still. It would be like someone, three days after Princess Diana died, asking someone in Trafalgar Square or walking out of London, three days later, what are you talking about, Princess Di? And people just going, what? Where have you been? I mean, this is pretty much what they say. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there these days? Basically saying, are you the only one in the whole city that doesn't know what's just happened? Which is funny, isn't it? Because Jesus was the only one in the city that did know what had happened. (laughs) So it's quite amusing. And then Jesus, almost toying with them, goes... What things? he asked. And this is where I want to draw your attention to. Look in verse 19. Jesus asks, what things? And they say, about Jesus of Nazareth. You see that? They don't say, about Jesus Christ. 
Jesus the Saviour, Jesus the Messiah. No, now, because of his death, um, he's just Jesus of Nazareth. He's just human. He is not the one. They say he was a prophet. He was a great speaker, orator. He was powerful in word and in deed. He did these great miracles before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. Verse 21, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And then what is more, what is more we've got this peculiar story of women coming to the tomb and angelic visitors and all this sort of stuff. But the point is, is that they see him as Jesus of Nazareth. The crucifixion on its own means it's the end of Jesus. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Christ. Now compare verse 19 with verse 34. Because the, verse 34, they meet, after, after they meet the risen Jesus, and he has the meal with, with them, and then their eyes are opened, they run back to Jerusalem, and what are they calling Jesus now in verse 34? Verse 33 says, They got up, they returned at once to Jerusalem. They now know who Jesus is. And that, there they found the eleven, that's the eleven disciples, and those with them assembled together in that upper room, saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. They are in agreement, at least, with that Jesus is now, again, the Lord. He's the Messiah. So the resurrection then vindicated who Jesus was. Without it, he's just a prophet. He's just Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, this was the definitive final miracle or sign that pointed us to Jesus being the Christ, being God's Son, being the Messiah, being the Saviour, Rescuer. Up until that point, they believed that they were still perhaps even in the exile under God's judgment and they'd hoped that Jesus would be the real Rescuer, but he's not. But now they realise he is the Rescuer, Redeemer, Christ, Messiah, Lord. So the resurrection vindicates who Jesus is. Thirdly, the resurrection vindicates the Old Testament. The Old Testament in various ways foretells, foreshadows both Jesus' death and resurrection. And Jesus points this out to these two people on the road to Emmaus. They, he speaks to them in verse 25 and he says, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. He's basically saying, did not you read in the Old Testament what it said about me? Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory, be resurrected? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He's vindicating what the Old Testament said and was building to. That all of these promises and images and stories were all pointing to Jesus and his death and resurrection. The resurrection vindicates the Old Testament. I mean, he has the most amazing Bible study with these two people. I mean, it would have been great to just sit here, be a fly on the wall and hear Jesus walk through the 39 books of the Old Testament, pointing out how it all points to him. You know, perhaps he, he talked through the story of Noah, the biblical story, not so much the Russell Crowe story, but the biblical story of Noah, and how it points to himself. And how even Genesis, at the end of Genesis, the story of Joseph is a resurrection story. It's a picture of Jesus. I was in a meeting, by the way, in Macquarie University about 12 years ago, sitting with secular lecturers of ancient history uh, who were specialising in Judeo-Christian history. I was in a meeting with them, with their lecturers, and a Jewish rabbi who were all discussing how the story of Joseph is a resurrection story. These weren't Christians necessarily. These were non-Christians discussing how the resurrection, uh, resurrection theme can be found in the story of Joseph. And it happens all the way through. There are, there are story, what about the story of Jonah? 
I'm sure, or Zechariah 12, or at the end of Isaiah 53, I'm sure Jesus took them through such passages. And while you've got your Bibles open, have a, have a look uh, forward to verses 44 to 46. He does it again. Jesus said to them, verse 44, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything, that, uh, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's like a threefold division of the 39 books of the Old Testament. The law, the prophets, the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. In those days, of course, the scriptures of the New Testament hadn't been written yet. The scriptures are the Old Testament. He is verifying, vindicating the Old Testament is true. It's come about through his resurrection. So the resurrection vindicates God's word. Fourthly, the resurrection vindicated what Jesus did on the cross. It vindicates his death on the cross. Look at verse 25 in that chapter 24. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to, be to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And look at the way all comes up again. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It seemed like a real popular view of Judaism in the first century was to think about and talk about and look forward to all the great things in the future that the Messiah will do. So people talked about a victory Messiah, a victorious Messiah, a Messiah who would conquer enemies and vindicate Israel and, and uh, you know, crush enemies and be victorious in so many ways. People talked about a Messiah who's going to do that. It seems that very few people were looking for a suffering Messiah, a Messiah who would die, a Messiah who would lay down his life, a Messiah who would be despised and forsaken, a Messiah of Psalm 22, say, or a Messiah of Psalm 53. There were a few Jews, by the way. The Essenes seem to have come up with two Messiahs because they realised that there was a suffering Messiah and a victorious Messiah. So the Essenes, who were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls, talked about two Messiahs trying to marry the two ideas. But most Jews look for the victorious Messiah, the conquering, the Russell Crowe Arnold Schwarzenegger Messiah. And this is why Jesus has to say, how foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets. Don't just look at these passages, but look at all of it. Did not the Messiah have to suffer as well? Ah, he did. And then he explains how he, his death on the cross is the victory. See, look, if Jesus was just human, then he would be sinful. And if he's just sinful, then he can't take my sin as well as his own. He has to, his death has to pay for his own sin. Only if he's sinless can he be a substitute for me. Only is his blood worth so much that he can pay the sins of the whole world. So the resurrection was vindicating that not only was he the Messiah, but his death on the cross paid the penalty for our sins. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. But the resurrection vindicates that his death on the cross was sufficient enough for my sin. So it vindicates Jesus' words, it vindicates who he is, it vindicates God's word in the Old Testament, it vindicates his death on the cross, that it's all sufficient for me. And fifthly, and lastly, and I'm sorry, but this requires the most brain power at this point. Fifthly and lastly, the resurrection vindicated what Jesus will do. This is clear in the writings of Paul. It's not so clear in... Luke 24, but it's clear in the writings of Paul because Paul keeps on saying Jesus' resurrection is the first fruit of what is to come. It's the first example, it's the movie preview of what is to come. 
It's a taster, if you like, of the great feast at the end of time. In fact, Jesus' whole ministry is like that. It is a window into the future of him raising people from the dead and healing people and calming storms and things is a window, a movie preview of the main feature at the end of time. So Paul talks about, in agricultural terms, that Jesus' resurrection is the first fruit, the first orange or grapes or apple of the great harvest that is to come. But you get it here in, verse, in, in chapter 24 as well. In verse 28, look what happens. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on if he was going a little further. But these two on the road to Emmaus say to him, Stay with us. It is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Then verse 30, When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. This is incredibly significant. I don't know whether you've ever really thought about what's going on at this moment. Can you see what is so unusual about verse 30? What is unusual about verse 30? Brilliant. That's it. He's playing the host. He's in their house, but he's playing the host. In other words, he's showing them something about what he's going to do. He breaks the bread and gives it to them. He's the supplier of the banquet that he's lying down before them. And the way it's worded, he broke bread, he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, echoes two incredible events in Jesus' ministry. The first is the Last Supper. It's exactly the same thing. That this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you. It's echoing that, that we feast on, but it also echoes further back exactly what Jesus did in the feeding of the 5,000. He takes bread, breaks it, gives it to the disciples. To, and here, it's certainly in the feeding of the 5,000, he is the, the Lord of the banquet that feeds and satisfies everyone. In this little window then, they're getting a view of Jesus as the head of the banquet, the host who feeds his people. It's a taster, a window into things to come. And it has been pointed out by some very observant theologians that the beginning of the Bible starts with the story of a meal. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve take fruit from the tree that they're not supposed to eat from they eat it, and what happens? Their eyes are opened, and from then, they, they, they're cast out of God's presence. Now here is Jesus feeding these two people, and dare I say it, it is a man and a woman, and their eyes are opened, not to evil, but to who God is and who Jesus is. Their eyes are opened. They see the whole picture. Ah, the light bulb goes on at that moment. And then they run back to <coughs> Jerusalem, which is highly significant in Luke's gospel. And just lastly on this, Karen and I were friends with Earl Ellis, who sadly passed away a few years ago. Earl Ellis was at the time, well, for, for many decades, one of the most eminent Bible scholars in the world. You pick up any decent textbook on particularly the New Testament and you'll see references to his incredible works. Earl Ellis noted that there are eight meals in Luke's Gospel. The seventh meal is the Lord's Supper, almost completing the first week 
and then suggests that possibly this meal with the two on the road to, to Emmaus being the eighth one is the beginning of the new week, the beginning of the new day, the beginning of a new era. I don't know if Earl is right, but that is pretty interesting. Whatever you think, these early disciples through this meal then see and understand Jesus. And through this resurrected host, they understand who Jesus is and what he's going to do in the future. So the resurrection, I don't know if you can remember it by using, uh, if you've got five fingers, unless you're from Tasmania, five fingers, <laughs> uh, it resurrects, uh, it vindicates, sorry, Jesus' words. The resurrection vindicates who Jesus is. The resurrection vindicates God's word in the scriptures. The resurrection vindicates what Jesus did on that cross. And the resurrection vindicates what Jesus will do in the future. Let's pray.